explain where I am in terms of the research that I am organizing now on Am uh, Amazonians during pandemic. Um, this study is part of an umbrella studies that are being um, uh, conducted uh, by different scholars at Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. The, the type of uh, research that I am organizing is based on my experience during the pandemic with the diverse Amazonian individuals and um, through basically contact that I, that I had via Facebook, via WhatsApp or telephone communication. I have been in contact with them a lot. Um, okay, um, I think from the beginning, I would like to say that Structurally speaking, the Amazonian, especially the Amazonian tribes or Amazonian nations have not been counted really on part of the state. There is always been a neglect and basically I would say uh, an abandonment because they are never, they have, I mean, there has never been a health um, system that would, uh, that has been focused on the problems that they have. Now they, uh, the Amazonians, the Amazonian groups that I have been in contact with are from the area of Loreto, mainly the Shipibo Conibo people, and the Awajun in the area of Condorcanqui. Both nations uh, are um, people that have a lot of uh, speakers of the language, the same as the Ashaninka. And my, I have my story with them is not doesn't start in during the pandemic, but it starts like around ten years ago when I um, organized and I directed and taught a, a certificate program on indigenous leadership that was organized by the parliament, indigenous parliamentary group of Peruvian Congress. I kept in contact with many of them. At that time, they were young, you know, leaders, and now female and male have become very strong leaders in their communities. One example is the one that you're looking in the in the poster right now, where it says Pandemia Shipibo. Um, that is Ronald Suarez. Ronald Suarez was, was one of my students at this uh, certificate program. He is now the president of Koshi Cox, um, which is one organization that leads to uh, sovereignty, to, to have the Shipibo, to, to bring the Shipibo nation, let's say, to become sovereign. And um, there he is giving out the mascarillas to one of the, uh, of the ladies in the community. He became infected. I was in contact with him over the phone, as I said, because of my work as an activist on language rights, I do have a group on Facebook that ultimately uh, became like common ground, like a meeting ground for a lot of people whose stories were not being heard. I mean, they didn't find outlets to make people know what was going on. He became infected, his mother, he had to be, you know, attended, he was in bed, his mother became ill. And I know Mrs. I, I had met Mrs. Marcelina Minas. She was a weaver. She was a Kennedy designer and a, and a Kennedy weaver. In four days, she was gone. And he became ill. He was, he, he went, he was, um, uh, sent into the hospital. We didn't know if he was going to survive. And that's when I became in contact with so many Shipibo people. They have been affected tremendously. The amount of death toll between them has been tremendous. And, you know, so much as um, only one um, newspaper called Hildebrand and Sustres reported on them. Uh, they call it the Pandemia Shipibo because they were in so much affected, so many of them died. And let me tell you, this is something that I'm also integrating into my study. It was not just about being at um, help with emergency services because they were, you know, apparently being affected by the COVID, but they, they already had been affected, for example, over the years, you know, with oil spills, with their entire diet being changed because they, they, the, there was no more fish. Um, a lot of animals were not, you know, being seen and different vegetables or food that they used to, to have as an organic diet also changed. Uh, their diet changed tremendously and there have been webinars in which elders have talked about this. Um, he, um, the, the situation became 
uh, tremendous because they had no no okay one thing was the fact that they they became sick but the other one was the fact that the people that died let's say out in the communities in the river there were no protocols no one was saying what should they do with them and i received messages and been in contact with people stating that all they did was send them to the river you know while all of these sort of tremendous pain and and total lack of there was no guidance uh, I began to receive messages from other places like the Uradina were also getting a lot of people sick and a lot of people were, were showing symptoms and the way they have been affected has, has been terrible. Therefore, what I've done with all of the messages that I've been sent is I opened an archive, an archivo, tengo un archivo, and I am dividing it chronologically, chronologically to understand how the curve started and how it went up and how much they were completely unattended by the state they were not uh at any point helped um so one of the things that i am trying to explain through this month by month narrative is to show how the pandemic spread and in some ways how was the role of my group to vote to provide a voice for the communities that were affected no so that's where I am. I am conducting also interviews. Uh, I'm starting because we are not completely out of the pandemic right now. <laughs> it's still going on. So the curve has gone down and I am looking at the resilience. OK, um, so more or less, that's where I am. I am organizing this as a qualitative study, although I'm going to use some charts from the amount. We don't have exact numbers and um, I don't think the Ministerio de Salud probably is going to be that interested in how many Amazonians died and in the which the way they they died. But at least I'll have some numbers, and I'm looking at something called communicative justice in health, which is um, it's a theory and methodological approach that has been used in uh, Philippines. Um, um, well. It, it talks more about people whose stories are not portrayed in the media, uh, nor their, uh, you know, their presence. So this invisibility uh, is something that needs to be changed. And I guess promoting their stories is important through social media as something that is uh, communicative justice activism. And um, so that's where I am. 